Hi, and welcome back to my channel, Learning Biology with Dr. Vanessa, where I teach you all about how your body works so that you can make better health decisions for your future. In today's video, we are going to talk about red blood cells. We'll talk about how they're produced, their life cycle, and their function. Disclaimer, the doctor in my name comes from the PhD I earned. I am not a medical doctor. My videos and content are for educational and informational purposes only. This is not to be used in lieu of medical advice, but to educate you. If you have a true medical emergency or issue, please see your physician. Let's dive right into red blood cells, which are also called erythrocytes. Red blood cells are found in the blood and the most numerous of all the blood cells. Erythrocytes have hemoglobin, Hemoglobin is a protein found in red blood cells that allow the red blood cells to carry oxygen. It is also a pigment which gives red blood cells their red color. Hemoglobin makes up about 33% of the red blood cells weight. There are about 5.4 million red blood cells per microliter of blood. Now, since you probably don't know what a microliter is, let's give you an idea of that. In one drop of blood, one drop, there's about 50 microliters. So if you multiply 5.4 million times those 50 microliters, that will tell you just how many red blood cells are in one drop of blood. Wow, that really tells you how tiny they are and just how many are found in the blood. They are about seven to eight micrometers in diameter very, very tiny. So have you ever wondered why blood appears red? It's because there are so many red blood cells in such a small area, um, and those red blood cells have the hemoglobin pigments in there, and that's what's giving blood its red color. Red blood cells also have what we call a biconcave shape, which you can see in the picture. You see how it kind of looks like a flattened out donut if the donut still had its hole. This is because red blood cells lack a nucleus. They actually spit out their nucleus during development. And this shape is really important because it helps the red blood cell carry the maximum amount of oxygen as opposed to the cell being spherical. Also, since they lack this nucleus, they cannot reproduce and they have a finite lifespan of around 120 days. One of the main purposes of a red blood cell is to be able to transport oxygen. Together with the fact that the red blood cell has no nucleus and that biconcave shape, it has a greater surface area and more room to be able to transport this oxygen. But how does it transport the oxygen? And we can look at the molecule that we find in red blood cells that is referred to as hemoglobin. Not only does hemoglobin give red blood cells its red color, it also uh, helps to transport oxygen. There are about 200 and 80 million hemoglobin molecules in one red blood cell. That is insane. 280 million of these hemoglobin molecules that are found in one red blood cell. Hemoglobin is composed of the heme portion, which is the ring-like non-protein portion of the hemoglobin, and the globin portion, seen in blue here, which is the protein portion. The heme portion, if we look at it more closely, in the center of each one has an iron ion. This iron ion can combine with one oxygen molecule each, so each hemoglobin has the capacity to bind with four different oxygens. If we multiply that four times 280 million, we could see the total oxygen carrying capacity of one red blood cell. However, a red blood cell never gets fully saturated, but it is set up in this way so that when it does go through the lungs, it can grab as much oxygen as possible. Hemoglobin is also going to transport about 23% carbon dioxide as it passes through 
out all the cells in the body, uh, this is going to be brought back to the lungs and then exhaled. This is a waste product of metabolism of the cells. The red blood cell life cycle. The red blood cell lives about 120 days. It cannot synthesize new components. Why? Why do you think it cannot synthesize any new components? If you said, because it doesn't have a nucleus, then you're right. Ruptured red blood cells are removed from circulation and destroyed by fixed phagocytic macrophages in both the spleen and liver. Let's go ahead and discuss this figure, which depicts the formation and destruction of red blood cells. First, we start with the death of red blood cells. In both the spleen and liver, there are phagocytic macrophages, which are going to phagocytize the red, the old worn out red blood cell. The globin and heme portions of hemoglobin are split apart. Globin is broken down into amino acids, which can be reused to synthesize other proteins. Iron is removed from the heme portion in the form of iron 3 plus or ferric ion, which associates with the plasma protein transferrin. This transferrin is a transporter for iron 3 plus in the bloodstream. The iron 3 plus transferrin complex is then carried to red bone marrow, where red blood cell precursor cells take it up through receptor mediated endocytosis for use in hemoglobin synthesis. Iron is needed for the heme portion of the hemoglobin molecule and amino acids are needed for the globin portion. Vitamin B12 is also needed for the synthesis of hemoglobin. Erythropoiesis in red bone marrow results in the production of red blood cells which then enter into circulation. When iron is removed from heme, the non-iron portion of heme is converted into biliverdin, a green pigment, and then into bilirubin, a yellow-orange pigment. Bilirubin then enters the blood and is transported into the liver. Within the liver, bilirubin is released by liver cells into bile, which passes into the small intestine and then into the large intestine. In the large intestine, bacteria convert bilirubin into urobilinogen. Some urobilinogen is absorbed back into the blood and converted to a yellow pigment called urobilin and excreted into the urine. Most urobilinogen is eliminated in feces in the form of a brown pigment called stercobilin, which gives feces its characteristic color. So in summation, the amino acids from the globin portion and the iron are both reused in order to make red blood cells, while the heme portion is converted into different pigments that are then excreted from the body. Let's take a look at how red blood cells are produced. This production of red blood cells is termed erythropoiesis. It starts in the red bone marrow with a precursor cell known as the proerythroblast. The proerythroblast divides several times, becoming several different types of cells, and then begins to synthesize hemoglobin. At the end of development, the cell finally ejects its nucleus and becomes what is called a reticulocyte. The loss of the nucleus causes the center of the cell to indent, producing the biconcave shape that the red blood cell is known for. They then pass from the red bone marrow to the bloodstream. Reticulocytes develop into mature red blood cells within one to two days after their release from the red bone marrow. Erythropoiesis and red blood cell destruction normally proceed at the same rate. Let's quickly take a look at some disorders in which red blood cells cannot carry oxygen properly. 
These disorders cause homeostatic imbalances, so we're throwing the body off from its natural balance of how much oxygen should be there being given to the cells. Anemia is one of these disorders. This is a lack of sufficient healthy red blood cells. The oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is now reduced, and it's actually one of the most common blood conditions in the U.S. Symptoms of anemia include that the person is fatigued and intolerant of the cold. Their skin appears pale due to the low content of red colored hemoglobin. The causes can include iron deficiency, megaloblastic anemia, which is red where the red bone marrow produces large abnormal red blood cells plus others. So the causes can be genetic or just some sort of diet deficiency. Other causes of anemia include blood loss, decreased or faulty red blood cell production. One of the number one causes of anemia is iron deficiency or the destruction of red blood cells without them getting old, going through their 120 day life cycle, etc. Anemia caused by faulty red blood cell production includes sickle cell anemia. In sickle cell anemia, the hemoglobin is made abnormally. The S-shaped erythrocytes can just not carry oxygen as well as the other one because they are not made in the same way. You can see a nice healthy red blood cell up here, a sickled cell uh, blood cell uh, down below. This one just does not have the carrying capacity that it needs to have. The other thing is it's only one amino acid change, you can see right here, that creates this effect. The symptoms include anemia, jaundice, the person may experience joint or bone pain, breathlessness, rapid heart rate, abdominal pain, fever, and fatigue. This is, a, this is an inherited disease. What happens if oxygen carrying capacity drops and the body is not getting the oxygen that it needs? This is when we can see negative regulation of erythropoiesis kick in. If there's not enough oxygen in the body, what is the body going to do to return that back to normal? Remember, whenever we bring something back to normal, it's going to uh, have a negative feedback system that's going to help do that. So the main stimulus to get this system into play is that there's going to be a decrease in the oxygen carrying capacity of blood. So normal oxygen levels in the blood are going to start to decrease and this is going to start the whole system. So we disrupt homeostasis in the system by decreasing uh, the amount of oxygen that's in the blood, oxygen that then gets delivered to any of the other tissues. Well, when that low oxygen blood gets to the kidneys, the kidney cells are going to detect those low oxygen levels. And when they do, they're going to increase the erythropoietin that's secreted into blood. Remember, erythropoietin is that hormone that is going to be needed in order for red blood cells to be produced. As that happens, the proerythroblasts that are in the bone marrow are going to start to mature quickly into reticulocytes. So kidneys will release this erythropoietin. It's going to travel in the blood, make its way finally to the red bone marrow and kick up production um, into reticulocytes. So more and more proerythroblasts will become reticulocytes. Once those reticulocytes enter into the blood, they're going to eventually mature in about one to two days, and there's going to be a larger number of red blood cells in circulation. Eventually, this is going to help to increase oxygen delivery to the tissues, and once things go back to normal, we can shut this system off because the kidneys are going to detect that the oxygen levels are back to normal and will stop secreting erythropoietin. Thank you so much for watching my video. I hope that this video helped you better understand what red blood cells are and what they do. If you have any questions or comments, please make sure to put them in the comment section below. And if you haven't already, please make sure you click on that subscribe button, hit that notification bell so that you never miss out on a new video. I really do appreciate your subscriptions and your support, and I love reading your comments.
See you next time.